sure. I mean, the, I suppose the simplest, simplest way to come into this is to think about uh, a, 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 an axiomatic claim or proposal that I'd want to make, which is that money, public subsidies that are intended to support journalism in the public sphere uh, should, be, uh, uh, should be made subject to the direction of that same public. And by what I, mean, I'm, what I mean by that is that each citizen, in virtue of being a citizen, should have an equal share of the power to direct journalistic inquiry and in a, as a second order power uh, an, an equal ability um, to, to determine the prominence with which uh, material is treated in the, in the wider field. So there's really a two-stage process in public commissioning. The first is uh, a process by which uh, the public can direct resources towards various kinds of journalistic inquiry and research. Uh, the second uh, is the process by which that that public reflects on the material thus generated. So I suppose the idea of public commissioning is that we make the, uh, the creation of the public sphere, the, the creation of the general field of communications, a public matter. A public matter in the sense that uh, it is, is a space in which egalitarian power is exercised by individuals. Um, and a public matter in the sense that the deliberations are themselves transparent. Uh, the deliberations are something upon which uh, the public as a whole can reflect uh, and through which individuals can learn more about uh, the dispositions of people like them and people who, are, people who aren't like them. So we change uh, the, the, the nature of the communications field precisely by introducing the eventual consumers of media content as co-producers, as people who are involved in the production process. Uh, that's, the, that's the very general uh, position that I take. The problems with it are manifold, and many problems with this. Uh, the first problem that one has is that it runs counter to dominant frames for thinking about the media. Overwhelmingly, we have two families of legitimation when we're talking about the media. We talk about the idea of the professional, uh, the, 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 the journalist, uh, editor, who is in possession of certain special properties of mind uh, that qualify them to make decisions about what constitutes the public interest. And the second family is this idea that the, the, the marketplace will be the, is the only mechanism by which we can discover popular preferences. The public interest is what the public is interested in at the moment of consumption. So those two those two families are, uh, you know, we say in Shakespeare says, you know, two, ha two, two families alike in dignity. Um, uh, they're the Montagues and the Capulets, if you like, of uh, media debate. What they share is a deep hostility to the idea of really the, 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 um, the public as co co collaborator or co-producer in the, in the media field. So the, the overwhelming way in which we talk about the media doesn't permit this notion any leeway, so it's very difficult for the eventual beneficiaries of this system to become aware of it and its implications. So that's, that's a, a practical problem about uh, getting something like this started. There are huge implications uh, in, in terms of the practicalities. Once one starts to think about uh, how do you run a, um, uh, a system of public commissioning in the real world as the world is structured now as a, as a kind of institutional reality, there are incredibly important uh, issues of implementation uh, that I would never seek to, uh, to downplay. What I propose, I think, is uh, an incremental process by which we start by entertaining the possibility that the people who pay for the media uh, should have some degree of say in what the media is. It seems like a first, a first stage to, to, to engage with. Um, and we can reflect for a moment there as to why that is such an unusual conception. Why is it so exotic, if you like, to say if 
if you have money taken from you in the form of a license fee or indeed in the form of general taxation, which is used to support media production, why is it that that media production takes place beyond your view? Why is it that it's then taken away from general oversight and that it's the product rather than the process of production that you get to see? What's, what, why is it peculiar to think in any other terms? But once we've, once we've accepted the general principle, uh, which is a good neoliberal principle, that if you pay for something, you should have some uh, degree of, uh, of say in, in what, what you're buying. Um, once you accept that principle, there, there follow a huge set of, as I say, practical considerations. Uh, what kinds of inquiry for practical purposes should we allow into a field to be chosen uh, by this commissioning public? Um, what kinds of implications does this have for the workplace? These are, these are real issues, and I, and I wouldn't pretend to have, have final answers on any of them. Mm -hmm. well, okay, so um, the first question is, is, uh, is the nature of deliberation, if you like, that goes into this um, uh, into this process. I mean, the, the, the default that I had was that, um, that these, this power to commission should be exercised by the individual. It should be, as it were, uh, an individuated power, uh, an inalienable power, um, uh, which would, so in the final analysis, I would cast my vote, I would make my decision about what project or what projects or what publications or what, or what, what programs of research I wanted to support. But in virtue of having that power, I would be motivated to discuss with others as to how to use it. Um, the way in which I discuss with others would be entirely a matter for self-organization. I could sit in my room as a solitary philosopher king and decide that my one euro fifty of public commissioning money this month will go to this project, or I could I could join in an online forum to discuss it, or I could sit down with people in my community, talk to friends in uh, in, in social environments and so on. It would become a topic of conversation, right? Much as a, uh, a successful reality TV show is something people talk about now, um, it would be something that would be normal to discuss, maybe. Uh, maybe it would be something that people, some people were uncomfortable discussing publicly. Who knows? I don't know how the, uh, the, 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 uh, how each individual or each group will, will refer to it. But what's crucial, it seems to me, is that it gives people who have a sense of being underrepresented in the public sphere, it gives them a very real motive uh, to meet with uh, people who, who have a similar concern and look at ways in which they can frame their particular concerns uh, in a form that will uh, connect with a wider audience. Um, if you think about uh, minorities, you think about vulnerable groups in society, or uh, ways in which, for example, um, uh, you know, class violence is played out in society and the media is very much part of this, this machinery by which um, people uh, in vulnerable positions in the class, class system are demonized or, or, or subjected to various kinds of um, you know, symbolic violence, to use that phrase. Um, this would give people a means to respond. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that they definitely will, and that's, that's, that's why we should do it. I'm saying that it's not a question of other people advocating on their behalf. It's not about well-meaning people who are parachuting into these communities and saying, oh, don't worry, we're here to help you and protect you from uh, the, the meanness of a, of a broader culture. It's an opportunity for communities to say, well, actually, what's happening to our, uh, to our local environment, what's happening to our school system or our health service, it is of general applicability because it, it touches on universal issues of justice, 
universal issues of truth, right? The government is lying, or um, local power magnates are lying. There, are, there is an injustice here that deserves wider uh, uh, awareness. So to go back to your original point, I, I'm an agnostic as to what forms of organization it would, um, it would lead to. I don't think there would be any one single answer. I don't think you, you should think in terms of imposing uh, one single answer. My hope is that um, people would, would find solutions that worked for them as both individuals and as groups. Um, and the second part, of your, second part of your question is kind of related to the first in a way. Assuming that this does lead to some kind of uh, higher velocity of uh, exchange of views, to, to, to use that, that kind of analogy, assuming that it, it does uh, lead to more conversations about what's going on, what, what we should know more about, what, what's being poorly described, what, what could be better described, how would we do it, and so on. This would lead quite neatly to, to the second order problem, which is how do you ensure that uh, material that is generated by this system doesn't remain, as it were, internal to its commissioning publics, right? Um, the, one of the features that we see in, uh, in the digital space is this, uh, that the technology can be used to create communities of knowledge, communities of common shared concern. And those communities can be quite, they can give in a sense of being, of reaching to the horizons, right? You can be in your social net network feeling that everyone knows about these issues and everyone's kind of down with that. And in reality, you know, on the other side of the horizon, there is a whole world of people who are indifferent. They don't know, and they don't they haven't got the beginnings of a, a framework to even understand what you're talking about. And the danger, I think, it, 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 if you like, in the corporate digital future, if it's left un, un, unchallenged, is that radicalism will survive. It will. There will be pockets in which people networking internationally, perhaps much more eff effectively, will be able to communicate and share ideas and have a sense of community but one which is never in any danger of reaching out to a, to a broad public. Um, and that broad public space will become even more completely subject to uh, the determinations of, of a tiny number of state and, and corporate kind of actors. So one of the key points about the, the, the idea of public commissioning is that whatever is being investigated, whatever is being um, looked at, researched by um, by journalists at, at the behest of a, a commissioning public, that material, once produced, needs to find its way into uh, the, the mainstream, you know, the bloodstream of, of, of the public, if you like. Um, and there are ways in which we can think about doing that. Um, there are ways in which uh, the, the resources of a, of a public service broadcaster, for example, could be reconfigured to allow uh, I mean, to, just to, you know, to take an example, you could imagine a situation where um, uh, material that's produced would, um, would be looked at by a jury, right? So a cross-section of the public, not experts or anyone, they'd see material that was being, being, being produced uh, that was intended for a general audience, say. I mean, if you, if you, if you want to commission stuff that the general audience doesn't understand, then that's your lookout. But if you, if you imagine a situation where a, a general audience, albeit limited, sees this material and says, I was really struck by that. I think that's the one that we should put on prime time. For, on, you know. So you could have some way in which the prominence of material uh, was increased or decreased on, the, on, some, on some sort of independent mechanism. There are other ways of doing it. You could have... Um, you could have voting mechanisms, you could have ways of people who see material saying that they value it very greatly, um, but there would be ways in which you might, that might be gamed. There might be ways in which that would be manipulated. So the, 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 the detailed dynamics of how you, you bring material into a shared public sphere are a subject for trial and error, it seems to me. Um, the advantage of... Um, uh, beginning anything is that the the process itself w will attract a degree of interest um, but how you how you establish this as a stable part of a uh, an information regime if you like uh, is very much up for for, for for trial and error
Sure, sure. Um, I mean, I think in practical terms, I mean, I was thinking about this a bit t today. I mean, I think one of, the, one, of the, um, one of the clear themes that's come out of the last few days and is, a, is a very clear theme in a lot of writing, I think, on, as it were, radical responses or, or adequate responses to the, to the crisis that we find ourselves in is the need to uh, make common cause, the need to make connections between uh, different social movements, different social networks. If we frame media reform in terms of a debate or an argument with media owners and state broadcasters, we have no chance, absolutely none. Um, they control, uh, still overwhelmingly, they control the means by which you reach an audience and they control the terms on which you can make your case to an audience even. Um, it, was, it was very interesting, for example, when I was asked on Radio 4 in my country, a BBC radio station, to talk about my ideas. Um, I was put on at the same time as a, uh, a conservative MP uh, who is a noted uh, expert on Edmund Burke. Uh, he's kind of, you know, an act, a proper thinking conservative. And they realized, I think, that if they were going to have uh, the notion of, uh, of the media being discussed, they had to be very careful about the way in which uh, the context was framed. So I wasn't given 15 minutes to... Uh, make, make a case, which is in itself is a difficult gig. Uh, I was in fact uh, sharing the time with a, um, with a very sophisticated conservative. So there's a, there's a deep anxiety about how these ideas are explored uh, in the mainstream. And if we leave it to, if we leave ourselves only that, that area of debate or discussion, we're going to lose. It's going to lose. Um, but what I think I'm saying about the re reorganization of the public sphere on democratic lines, it seems to me is of, a, 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 of acute interest, or should be of acute interest to um, a whole range of progressive social movements. Because if you want to save the environment, you, you, can, you have no hope unless the media system is reformed. If you want to achieve uh, gender equality, you have no hope uh, unless the media system and the, the public sphere that surrounds it are substantially reformed. Um, and one can go on and on. Every single um, progressive movement that I can think of that seeks to achieve its aims uh, without substantial reform of the media, it seems to me cannot, cannot do so. It's not going to win. So just as media reform can't win on its own terrain. Um, none of these groups can win on their own terrain. They all have to take into account uh, what is by definition the common terrain of deliberation, discussion, the common spot at which um, changes in, in, uh, in, in mind, changes in human sensibility, changes in uh, human understanding take place. Um, what are we going to do about the problem of extremism is often the question. What are we going to do about the fact that people are being drawn to these uh, extremist ideologies, extreme right ideologies, ideologies based on hate and fear and so on? Well, you have to, you have to look at the pollution of the sources of information that's taking place, not just in fringe uh, uh, extremist media, but in the mainstream. Right? The mainstream is making... Uh, these kinds of ideas is making itself hospitable uh, to these extremist ideas, um, often under the rubric of giving people what they want or uh, talking in ways that will be um, popular with their audiences. Right? So the, the, the language of, uh, uh, of market or, or, or even the language of um, public service deliberation can be used in a, in a way to make the, the mainstream deeply unsafe uh, and drive people mad, right? I mean, I was thinking of the analogy today, media owners saying, saying, well, you know what? People just like drinking salty water, right? We know they like drinking salty water because they keep asking us for more glasses of water. They're more and more thirsty. They want more and more salt in the water. And if you, all I'm saying is let's just, let's offer them an op, uh, like some water with no salt in it. Maybe they prefer that, you know? I don't, you know, I'm happy to compete with you, but let's see what happens when people can drink stuff that isn't, hasn't got these additives of, of hatred and fear and so on. So 
that's really my that's really my my sense at the moment is that uh, you know as a writer as a former publisher as a journalist and someone who operates within the media system as it is I'm I'm acutely aware that I'm simply not going to get these ideas across uh, if we operate uh, as though the media frame is the only re relevant point of departure. All the social movements, as I say, have a, have a stake in how the media is, is coordinated. If they allow themselves to be seduced into thinking that if they, just, if they get a bit better at the game, they'll get more coverage in the existing system. If they're just a little bit more clever at, at, at managing their relationships with journalists and with broadcasters and so on, if they're seduced into that thinking, they'll be kept on the margins indefinitely. If they stop and say, fine, we'll play the game as it's played now, but we'll start to, to talk seriously and loudly about how the game should be played in the future, they will be amazed by how quickly things change. Right? That's, that's, in a sense, my governing frustration, is that I talk to trade unions and they say, we don't want to go near the media because if we do, then it will... But if they, if they go for the media, that will actually, that will immediately help their particular cause, oddly. Um, so that's, that's, that's my best shot at that answer. I mean, I think these, these issues of, of uh, you know, organizing principles, if you like, in media, production are, are incredibly important. Um, the, the, the doctrine of balance, for example, that you find in uh, overwhelmingly in American journalism, where professionalism is very closely associated with the idea of being balanced. Um, this in itself, I think, it leads to a whole set of pathologies. Um, and I think there's a very interesting history to how journalism in the United States is professionalized, how journalists become a quite privileged group or a subsection of them become quite a privileged group in in the uh, in the political system um, and they they integrate themselves very effectively with um, with the political directorate the economic directorate uh, and the state bureaucracies and so on your point as well about the um, the overwhelming interest in biography uh, as an organizing principle in journalism, explaining events in terms of personal idiosyncrasies, finding villains. I mean, we saw this with um, Bernie Madoff, who becomes the emblematic uh, mistake, or the em emblematic uh, villain, if you like, of uh, the financial crisis. He becomes an explanation of a sort. In a different way, um, Alan Greenspan uh, becomes the explanation. It was all Alan Greenspan's fault. If you look at the way in which the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve is chosen, it's very deliberately designed so that essentially the financial markets decide. If a name is, is floated um, and there is a, a certain sense of jitter or um, dissatisfaction in the financial markets, that name will no longer go forward. So Greenspan, it, the pathology of Greenspan as an individual, if you like, is is directly mirrored by the pathology that he was representing that was structural in nature. He's almost a perfect example of the way that biography and history can coincide. Um, but to leave the historical out, to leave the history of the financial markets, to leave the history of, of what the financial sector wanted and what, where the financial sector came from as a, as a, as a class or as a body of, of people with a shared agenda, to leave that out, that structural side out of your, your account is much neater because you're left then with the Wizard of Oz, the hero with the feet of clay, a whole set of cliches that you can, uh, that you can um, reprise. But you leave the public radically confused about what was happening. So, I mean, there are ways, obviously, that there are important ways in which biography matters, there are important ways in which individuals matter. Um, the, the, the challenge of what um, C. Wright Mills called the sociological imagination is to try and reconcile uh, the individual uh, experience of life, what it, is, what it feels like now to be precarious, uh, with some structural account of why we're feeling precarious. Why, why, why are we in this uh, predicament? Um, because if you, if you have one without the other, I think you're, you, you, you either, you're left with a kind of 
um, a bloodless abstraction um, which, uh, which feels academic and which, which fails to capture the human reality of, of what's happening to people who are in conditions of precariousness, who are in these um, increasingly difficult uh, um, working conditions and so on. On the other hand, if you, if you, if you emphasize that to the exclusion of the structural, you can produce very affecting journalism, the kind of liberal um, accounts of the depression that we see in the 1930s are really the paradigm for literary nonfiction that follows. And it's very, very well written. It's very beautifully written and it's very affecting. But it doesn't give you any, any account as to why this is happening. Um, now, why, why, does, why is a certain kind of journalism organized in this, this way that privileges biography over history? It's to do with the incentives, right? Um, if you have a group of people who say, yes, it's important to, to register the human scale, the human dimension of this, but we also want to have a, a structural account. That's a different motivation for writers than an editor who says, I love this writing you've got here about the woman and her kids and how they didn't have enough money till Friday. Beautiful writing. It's statistics and stuff. I don't know. I think it might bore people, right? So you, you subject those kinds of decisions to a process which is opaque, which is unaccountable, and which I think, you know, I think we can see what happens, what plays out is that structural, um, structural accounts are de-emphasized and we have this emphasis on villains and tragic heroes and so on and so forth.